Through 1915 and 16, millions upon millions of soldiers marched to their deaths in what became a bloody war of attrition. In other words, the strategy on both sides was to grind down the enemy through sheer loss of life. Still, despite the unprecedented horrors of that terrible war and despite his failed efforts for peace, Pope Benedict didn't get discouraged. He didn't lose hope. And why not? Because he had a secret weapon. Benedict's secret weapon was not the poison gas that suffocated soldiers in the trenches on the Western Front. It wasn't the merciless spray of machine gun bullets that tore into the soft flesh of charging infantry. Nor was it the newly invented massive metal tanks that crushed men into blood-soaked earth. Rather, his secret weapon was she who crushes the proud head of Satan, the Blessed Virgin Mary. More specifically, Pope Benedict decided to invite all the sons and daughters of the Church to pray a solemn novena to Mary, our Mother of Mercy, for the intention of world peace. And here's what he said. To Mary, then, who is the Mother of Mercy, let loving and devout appeal go up from every corner of the earth, from noble temples and tiniest chapels, from royal palaces and mansions of the rich, as from the poorest hut from every place wherein a faithful soul finds shelter from blood-drenched plains and seas. Let this appeal bear to her the anguished cry of mothers and wives, the wailing of innocent little ones, the sighs of every generous heart, that her most tender and benign solicitude may be moved and the peace we ask for be obtained for our agitated world. On the eighth day of Pope Benedict's Novena, May 13, 1917, the Pope's plea for peace was finally answered. Yet the response came not from a prime minister, president, or king, but rather from a queen, the queen of peace herself. And she responded in a way that's typical of her humility. And by that I mean she traveled neither to the offices of heads of state nor to the papal apartments of the Vatican in Rome. Rather, she showed up in an obscure place in Europe, one that was as far away from the horrors of the war as possible. Specifically, she appeared at the far western end of the Iberian Peninsula in Fatima, Portugal, where she met not with diplomats or politicians, but with three simple shepherd children who were tending their flocks at a place called the Cova de Iria, 10-year-old Lucia dos Santos and her two younger cousins, 9-year-old Francisco and 7-year-old Jacinta Marto. To them, the beautiful lady appeared and then asked them to pray the rosary daily for peace and to do penance for sinners who had no one to pray for them and who were going to hell in such great numbers. Then she asked them to return to the kova on the 13th of each month. The heart of Mary's message was not just for the children, but for everyone. Specifically, it's a call to repentance and reparation for the many sins being committed in the modern world. Now, while Mary appeared to the children six times between May and October, Two apparitions were particularly important, the one in July and the one in October. Now, the core of the July 13th apparition can be divided into three secrets. Now, they were called secrets because Mary didn't want them to be revealed right away. Anyway, the first secret helps us understand why Our Lady of Fatima so often appeared looking so serious and sad. Specifically, it's because this secret consists of a terrible vision of hell that Mary revealed to the three children and that Lucia describes for us in the following passage. Se Nossa Senhora não tinha prometido para nos levar para o céu, acho que teria morrido de medo. Our Lady showed us a great sea of fire which seemed to be under the earth. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers of blackened or burnished bronze floating about in the conflagration. Now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves together with great clouds of smoke, now falling back on every side like sparks in a huge fire without weight or equilibrium and Emmy tricks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. The demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repellent likeness to brightful and unknown animals, all black and transparent. This vision lasted but an instant, 
how can we ever be grateful enough to our kind Heavenly Mother, who had already prepared us by promising in the first apparition to take us to heaven, otherwise I think we would have died of fear and terror. Now that vision of hell had a profound effect on the children. They became more serious and their hearts were filled with a burning zeal to save sinners by praying for them and making sacrifices for them. Now hearing Lucia's description of hell can have a profound effect on us too. I mean, think of it. In many ways, things are much worse in our day than they were in 1917. And so souls seem to be going to hell in massive numbers. To borrow St. Therese of Lisieux's expression, souls are being lost like flakes of snow falling on a winter's day and Jesus weeps. Yes, Jesus weeps, Mary weeps, and we should weep too. Still, our situation isn't hopeless. Our weeping need not lead to despair. In fact, there's good news, and that good news is this. God is not outdone by evil, and as we've already learned, He's offering massive graces and mercy in this our day. Why? Because now is the time of mercy. And as we learn in the second secret of Fatima, these graces of mercy come to us through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. 